dead can't speak, nor can the living hear you. Oh, hello. Hi. Welcome back to another episode of West Coast Avengers. Today I'm bringing you an amazing interview with two insanely talented creators, Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote, the creators, writers, and artists of Distillery's new book, Somna. But before we get to that interview, <laughs> don't forget to like, subscribe if you're not. I have a new podcast called Direct Edition. You can find all the links for that down below, including its own YouTube channel. And the podcast is wildly different than this show, but there are intermingling things. And coming to you on April 20th and 21st is DaveNgerCon. That is a two-day online convention found right here on my YouTube channel. I'm going to have great sellers, and I'm going to have creators, live drawings, raffles. It's going to be a fun time. And it's a live stream that happens over the course of two days, and they're pretty much all day. So with that... I bring to you my interview with Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote. Take it away, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have a epic stream for you today, a great interview. Uh, I am bringing you Becky Cloonan and Tula Lote, Lisa Wood, but Tula is her pen name. Uh, they are the co-creators, co-artists, co-writers of the most erotic folktale horror supernatural comic book that has ever existed, Somna from Distillery, as you can see there. And if you don't know either of them, uh, Becky had an epic run on Wonder Woman, Punisher, Gotham Academy, American Virgin demos, and has done some great movie posters and gig posters. And Tula, she most recently had that series with Scott Snyder, Barnstormers. She's also Supreme Blue Rose and one of the artists on Bodies, as well as an amazing illustrator of uh, posters and DVD movie artwork. All right, well, let's bring them on here. Good morning or Hi. good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are uh, we were splitting the uh, we were splitting the time zones right now and we've got yeah. uh, Lisa over here in the UK and Becky in the Pacific Northwest as well as me. So, we're we're cross we're crossing oceans right now. Yeah, we were all just together in in Seattle for Emerald City that feels like just yesterday. Yeah, we and that was <laughs> That was great. How was uh, overall experience for, for Emerald City this year for both of you? It was amazing. It's, um, it's the best um, Emerald City I've had. And um, I mean, like personally hanging out with people, it's like one of the best shows I've had in the US. It was lovely. Yeah, awesome. yeah. I used to do that show all the time and it's in a new convention center now. So mm -hmm. I guess last year was like the new one, but I haven't done this show since like 2019 or something. So uh, the new space was really cool. It had actual windows. So it's like yeah. you go to the convention and then you can like see the whole, like you get the whole, instead of like going to the con and then you smash cut to 7 p.m. and it's dark and you're like, what happened? <laughs> it's like time travel. <laughs> yeah, so the, the new convention center is lovely. It's really nice. It definitely is. And that was my first time there as well uh, after literally living blocks away from the old one for, for eight years. And uh, no, it, it, it was great. And um I had my wrap up last week on the channel and everybody seemed to really enjoy me walking around the con, talking to people, looking at artwork and stuff. And thank you once again, both of you for uh, providing me with some amazing artwork, including that heat piece. And as well as what we're going to talk about today, oh, a page yeah. from Ooh. Florida too. It's such a good page. Like that. I know. I know. So, so as we, as I said, and, and, you know, it says it on the cover that it's a bedtime story, but we all know it's, an erotic supernatural folk tale full of horror, witches, demons, and sex. And it's, uh, it is such a unique book. And I, I wanted to ask, um, between the two of you, uh, who was the seed for the idea? Because I know it's been germinating for a while. Yeah, it was, I, I just want to say, I'm sorry if you can hear that in the background. I don't know if you can, oh. but it's, Got my, I've got my puppy in the background just <laughs> trying to attack someone with my husband chasing after him. <laughs> uh, no, um, it's okay. it, yeah, it was Becky that first mentioned it. She came to me with, oh, we were like hanging out and you, you mentioned the idea and I said, like, that's so cool. And it was just like the very, very kernel of an idea. Like it was like the very start mm -hmm. of it. You know, before it was like a plot or I think I had like the very the concept and like how it was going to end i was like and this is how it ends <laughs> there's like nothing else 
yeah and, and I, lo- I love the ending it's so good I was like yeah we've got to do that yeah yeah so it was just like a like every time we would hang out or like see each other at cons it was always like let's take a few minutes to just like have a drink for ourselves and like sit down and talk about this thing so yeah um and and it's funny because I I did not and I, I apologize for only just learning this uh Lisa but um Thought Bubble which is you're the founder of Thought Bubble Festival in the UK. Yeah. And I guess that's where the two of you first met. Mm, or not? I feel like it was, was it San Diego? Yeah. Well, I think it might have been MCM in London. Oh. I, um. I think it was fangirling over you. I came to your yeah. table. Oh, maybe you were listed to be at Thought Bubble. And then I went over to your table and said, hello, you're coming to Thought Bubble. <laughs> Let me start chatting. Was that the year that we shared a bottle of Malibu in the parking lot? Oh no! <laughs> I can't. I can't remember. You were like on the street on like a bench or something, and you came up with like a brown bag, and it was there was Malibu inside. Like, Who drinks Malibu straight? Best, I think we're best friends. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got a brown paper bag story about me. It's really, it's really disconcerting, and I what? don't even remember that. But that must be right. And then uh, it friend- was a long time ago, you know. Oh you, we were. <laughs> it was the time we never when do, yeah. we'd never do such a thing now. <laughs> never. You, <laughs> some of the best friendships, though, do start over that you know that type of uh, situation. I mean, I had a really good yeah. friend from Scotland who started with whiskey. Literally, we became friends over drinking scotch. So, uh, you know, I I, well, I don't blame you both. Drink to form a friendship over yeah um so with the beginning of soma i want to go just a little bit for a little bit back devil's cut had the story the blighted flame was that something that the two of you created as like a not not a necessarily a pitch but a tastemaker to distillery to be like this is what we're going for yeah kind of yeah when we started that, it was more of like a proof of concept because we had never worked together before. And even though mm-hmm. I'm like such a big fan of, of Tula's art, like, you know, and I can see it in my head when I close my eyes, you know, uh, and it, it's, that's why, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so good. Um, but having never worked together, it was kind of like this, let's do this little short story that's going to be set in the same time period with the same vibes. Mm-hmm. So we can dig in with like to, we had already, like, I think we were already signed on with Somna. Like that was already our first book. Okay. Because Chip knew about this story from years ago. We had mm. <laughs> talked to, we talked to Chip, Mo- Chip Mosier about it. And he was like, this is the book you guys are going to do for us. Yeah. And for, for those of you that are watching that may not know Distillery, Distillery is about a year old now, new publisher, um, all magazine size, all, you know, I would say, r-rated or at least pg-13 and up rated stories for adults this is not a book you want to buy for your kids uh at least you know until they're out of high school but yeah it's it's such i i didn't know what somna was going to be like and when i read the story in devil's cut i didn't even know that the both of you were splitting your art duties and my mind was blown because i I can't remember the last time that anybody published anything that was like this with two distinctly different art styles that are really meshed together beautifully. Um, And, and was that the idea from the get go was like, Oh, I'm going to do half. You're going to do half. Was that kind of the idea from the beginning? Yeah. um, I mean, because, because of the way I draw, I think my art lends itself quite well to, to a kind of uh, there's an otherworldly element to it mm-hmm. it's a little bit ethereal um and so um i think it was becky that mentioned um me doing purely the dream sequences and it just made total sense because you know becky becky's settings and and ju- just drawing as a whole is absolutely incredible um and i kind of got off a bit lightly with my <laughs> um i mean becky's amazing at creating environments and having having characters grounded in in a certain era uh, and her work is perfect for that um and it just made it very easy for me to come in and just kind of take it to this other place and remove it from that a little bit 
but you would like draw stuff like in the background or like, you know, set pieces or something. And I would take that and like use it in mine. So there's, it went back and forth. Like we weren't just like, I didn't do all like it is my stuff is the real stuff. And then Lisa's stuff is the dreams, but like there's blending. You know, there is blending. Yeah. 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 And as the story goes on and the dream the dream world and the waking world mm -hmm. merged, we we a little bit and um I think that starts an issue to do the grave scene, uh, the funeral scene where it starts yeah. to be up a little bit. Yeah, the, 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 the dream world bleeding into the real world and vice versa. Yeah. And and you know, in that, I can clearly see that the two of you influence each other, which, you know, is great to see because it just lends for the, not just the story to be more natural, because, you know, I'm not sure how you divvy up the plot and dialogue, but it doesn't seem like it's divvied up. And that's, that makes for a great reading experience. Um, now, <clears throat> because, now I reread both issues last night just to have it real, real fresh in the brain. Um is it supposed to be taking place in Sweden or is it set in like early U.S. settling times or am I not supposed to know? Well, well, it actually, it vaguely takes place in Yorkshire and Whitby. Oh, okay. But this is like, this is kind of a, like an Easter egg kind of thing. Cause we, one of the big times that we had got together and talked about this was actually in Sweden. We were at a convention in Uppsala. Mm -hmm. And we ended up like standing on a Viking burial mound and being like, one day we'll make this comic. Like the wind is blowing and, you know, everything is it's dramatic. It's just as dramatic as you think it is. Uh, and then we like rolled down the hill and proceeded to <laughs> make this comic. That was like 10 years ago. So after that convention, I remember coming home and I was so psyched. I actually wrote out like a treatment for it. I was like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to send Lisa this like Google Doc or whatever. And it's like, basically the full plot and like because we had just come from Sweden I was starting to do like research on the Swedish witch hunts because we were like oh we can set it here like this it was very much like and this was so long ago it was like very in like the early stages of development mm -hmm. and so I looked up all these old like you know 17th century Swedish names and I was like here we go and then when we decided to set it in Yorkshire because it was like you know, Lisa's got the reference like at her fingertips and I've been there sure. so many times. It was like an easy time to like, you know, remember what, what it felt like. But we were like, well, the names will just stay the same. So we sure. have all Swedish <laughs> names <laughs> or mostly Swedish names, I think. And then, uh, so it just ended up being kind of funny the way it, the way it uh, worked out. Oh, I was going to say this story predates Salem. By okay. Like, but, uh, quite a bit, I think, because it's, you know, I mean, this was stuff that would like set the seed for what happened in New yeah. England. And in the horrifying time. Uh, mm. I mean, and and I know, like Becky, I know from your work, like you are very much uh, steeped in, you know, medieval, you know, all like the, mm. the old times, like the, the old the, times. I don't, I don't know <laughs> because it's like you, you know, you go back to Sweden. That's not even medieval. That's that's Viking time or whatever. Um, so I, and I know you're steeped in that. Did, was there specific research that either of you did that, you know, like, cause it seems, you know, I, I'm not a huge history buff, but it seems like this was really thought out in terms of like how people were accused, the kind of, uh, like witch finders being a real thing. Um, so was there a lot of thought put into that? Uh, cause it seems like there was. Yeah, I mean, it's always important to um, get all the elements right and create the world correctly. But at the same time, Becky and I were, you know, very sure that it, it didn't it didn't need to be like completely accurate. We love Hammer Horror and kind of their take on those um, those times. And you know, w one of our favorite films is Witchfinder General as well. So it's kind of the, there is a lot of reference there already, and we we did use a lot of that. I went back and watched some of my favorite films. Um, <laughs> but you know, because because the story is so fantastical, it's it kind of we do take liberties. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, yeah. I think the, like an easy shortcut to like making this because it is a, a fantasy comic. You know, at the end of the day, it's not like a historical fiction it's just pure right. fiction you know even yeah. though it's steeped in history 
and I did like a buttload of research for it. <laughs> but like I read so many books and like, you know, watched a bunch of documentaries and tried to learn about like, you know, what's the history here. But, you know, at the same time, it is like a hammer film, you know, where it's like we we're not trying to tell an accurate portrayal of like, sure. what life was like. Although there are parts in the story, like there's a sermon in issue two and there's like marriage vows in issue three that are basically just like plucked from actual like mm-hmm. sermons and you know marriage vows is like this is like there's a lot in there that is historically influenced you know yeah but i wouldn't go in on the record and say like this is any way accurate they didn't even like burn witches in england no you know no. like it's they hung them and they burn witches in scotland but they would like strangle them first <laughs> so it's like it's not you know when they're like burn the witch it's like well that's something that they did like on the continent so it's like more european i suppose yeah um but I don't know. So there's all this stuff that's like, it's not historically accurate in a right. lot of ways. But at the same time, it is heavily researched. So it feels like a real place. Like we want the story to feel lived in and we want the place to feel like tangible. Like you can taste it and smell it, you know? Well, and you know, there are a lot of flames in this book. And that's one of the things that I really noticed is uh, the transitions for the most part in the first two issues are kind of marked, you know, obviously the change in the art but there's sparks there's flames in all in most of the transitions was that something that was just like oh let's you know was that was that just one of the ideas that one of you had was like let's mark these transitions with uh you know the sparks and the flames that you kind of get when you see the first uh witch burning in that first issue yeah um it I can, a lot of it was intuition, what felt right, and just kind of just seeing Becky's work and how wonderful it is, and then how how we kind of snap out of snap out of the dream or you know mm-hmm. to to make them blend a bit more. But um, because there are a lot of um, ele- elements in, like the the most element that's used in this is fire, and then there's the water as well, where yeah. you know beginning in the dream scene he comes out of the water and then Mm -hmm. the issue she's in the bath and he comes out of the bath uh those two earth elements seemed um just a really nice way to repeat a pattern of what's going on in story and um and then the idea of fire being brought in just they're always being there um Mm -hmm seemed it seemed like a really nice way to make that transition happen and um also it's 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 just re- really lovely laying the the washers like the fire washers and uh, and the photographs that I use over Becky's lovely black line art as well it's kind of I don't know I just I really liked how that ended up looking mm-hmm. um yeah the 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 line art the all of the original art i've got to see a lot of it fortunately for me um i know i I, you didn't have all of yours at emerald city when i got there but i got to see enough and it i mean i'm already thinking okay are we getting an artist edition somewhere down the line because the colors are amazing in it but seeing what the art looks like without the colors it's almost like it it is a different comic i mean it, it it really has almost a creepier feel to it without color and with color it's yeah it's it, it, it's two different worlds but um so becky i know you're you know your ink and 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 pencil and then lisa you do a lot of uh digital on top of the kind of mixed media you're doing um yeah. and and is there just any insight into the process of uh, that either of you have with this specific book especially because the pages are twice up you know they're almost golden golden age size oh my god the pages are so big it takes me so long <laughs> to draw this book. <laughs> yeah, they, they are huge. gigantic look at that it's like i gave myself tennis elbow finishing a shoot three because i had to do so much traveling <laughs> it's bigger it's like it's like half the size of me it's ridiculous uh my process is really straightforward we, we actually like learned a lot on this book and this book was like un- unlike anything i've ever done before because mm-hmm. so much of it was like you try to plan out as best you can in the beginning and like Lisa and I have the same amount of pages in every issue. Right. So then it's like, we have to make a book map and figure out like where are things going to go, but that's inevitably going to change. So the book map has to be like modular enough so that like, if I'm like, Hey, I'm going to take some pages out of here and put them over here. It's not going to mess up like the pagination or anything. And then once it's all done and we can like look at the whole thing together, then there's like the inevitable 
like, okay, where do our pages need, like, do we need an extra few pages here to like yeah. add the sequence out or ease this transition a little bit? Like, is this too abrupt? How are we going to like, like there's a page in issue one that wasn't, we threw it in at the very end. It was when she's waking up. It's right at the beginning. It's like Tula's art and then my art right below mm-hmm. it of the same picture. So like that was something that we put in at the very end. It was almost like a guide for the reader at the very beginning. It's like, this is how it's going to work. She's sleeping and that's Tula's art. And then it switches and then it's my art. And it was like a visual cue for the reader. Mm-hmm. So it was stuff like that that we really had to like take into account. Um, and of course, Lee Leverage does the colors on my pages. And I've worked with him on like you know, everything pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So I love working with him. Um, and so he does my colors and figuring out how to like, you know, like how do we credit this book? <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like crazy because you know Lisa's yeah. process is like a little different. Sure. Yeah, with with me, I um I work in pencil. I'm doing my pages the same size as Becky, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so they are very large. But I prefer that because I can't. I find it really difficult to draw small, and I do a lot of um, car- I do. Facial characteristics, so um, I, I need something big to be able to get. I think we've lost Becky. I think she's switching off because of the, the headphones died. Yeah, um, I have to be able to work big to get like the expressions and stuff in there, so it suited me well. Um, but I work in pencil and powdered uh, graphite, kind mm-hmm. of brush powdered graphite over it. And then um, I set the powdered graphite with hairspray. It's this okay. really cheap hairspray you can get. It's cheaper than fixative. That's why I started using it. But in using this really cheap hairspray, it's super watery. So when you spray it on, um, all the charcoal starts to drip down and the pencil stays in place. But you get that kind of really nice grungy feel. And yeah. sometimes it... Yeah, sometimes it makes the image actually unrecognizable because it becomes such a mess. So I'll work back into that with white acrylic and Mm -hmm. then scan it and then tidy it up even more. Um, And then as I'm working, I might move certain panels around. Like it's very rare that you buy a comic page of mine where the page is identical to what you see in the book. I just, I mess things around a lot and it's kind of my process. It's how I work. I just like moving things around and figuring it out with the images that I have once they're scanned in. Um, So yeah, that that's, and and because I'm doing the dream sequences, it was a lot easier to do that. There was a lot more freedom to kind of just have ideas flow in as I'm going along and, um, decide what I'm going to do and then send it back to Becky and have her kind of hit off against that. Like a, like an exquisite corpse of a story. It really is like that. And I was like, by issue three, I'm very much like a what you see on the page is like what happens in the co- Like it's very, you know, I'm, I'm like, sorry, ridiculous for some reason about that or just too precious about like the original pages. But by the end, I was like, you know, after seeing like Lisa work that way, it made me loosen up a little bit, I think. And I was able to, you know, do a little bit more. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, stuff, I guess. <laughs> I, and, and the way you just described your process, uh, uh, it, it sounds like you're a wizard, like a, you know, like from the school of Bill Sankiewicz, you know, like he, I've heard stories. <laughs> about. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard stories about his process where he's like, put you know he's he's drawn something and then he's putting bleach on it and then the image changes and he just goes you know and and i can see that in the work in uh some of the pages i saw and maybe maybe i'm misremembering but correct me if i'm wrong there is a lot of uh almost x-ratedness in some of the stuff you drew uh for this book that isn't actually in the finished book but it's in your original art yeah yeah you you must have seen that emerald city Yeah. yeah I mean, we kind of really wanted to push the boat out with that stuff. And then mm-hmm. um, Chip and David kind of toned it down a little bit for us, which, you yeah. know, it's cool. we, we were fine doing that. Um, right. may, maybe there will be a, a more X-rated one. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll notice some, like, well-placed, like, strategically placed word balloons or some, like, shadows. strange yeah. shadows or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe we'll do, like, an uncensored version one day. 
But, you know, it's always better to just, like, go for the gold. Oh, you know? oh, yeah. <laughs> and, then, oh, yeah. and then if you have to change it in the end, because it was, it ends up being a thing of, like, you know, how do we distribute this? And how are bookstores going to, like, display this? Yeah. We wanted it to be a, something that didn't have to be shrink wrapped, except, like, the X-ray sure. covers. You know, that's a fun thing. But, right. Um, yeah. It's it's fine. <laughs> but it's, it is funny that it is... Uh, there is a dirty version, a dirtier version mm -hmm, <laughs> floating mm -hmm. around out there somewhere. <laughs> and, I, and I mean this with the, you know, like this is the, the most sincere way I can say it in a positive way. It is the horniest comic that I've ever read. And, and, <laughs> but in that, like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but in that, and, and I'm actually going to have Chip Zdarsky on the channel next week. And it's like, you know, with what him and Fraction did with sex criminals, I think really opened up the doors to the, you know, the image readers and, and those kind of readers for something yeah. like distillery and the stories. And like, I almost kind of want to draw some type of timeline where, you know, uh, Sona is the far, far away prequel to sex criminals, you know, where it's like, <laughs> yeah. well, this is actually how it started. Um, and, and once again, for anybody watching, your kids should not be reading this. And if you're afraid of, uh, you know, Frank sex talk, well, maybe this isn't for you at all, but you know, there's, there's the element of when, uh, Ingrid, right. Ingrid's the main character and she's, she's masturbating and, and, and then there's a demon and, you know, there's a lot going on in this book that, it, you know, there's layers to the story, which I love it because there's the, this is your conscience, you know, that like her inner thoughts are this demon. And I, yeah. I just, I want to applaud both of you for going for it. Like you, you went for it on this book. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry, you go, Becky. No, I was just, I was just musing. <laughs> thinking, <laughs> thinking it around in my head. I don't know. Um, I, it's funny because a lot of the artists that I follow online and on Patreon, like I've got like a, you know, my Patreon bill is like bigger than my phone bill <laughs> every month. <laughs> and I like just follow so many artists on there. And so many of them are doing like weird, like esoteric erotic work. Yeah. Um, and it's really like boundary pushing and it's beautiful and it's sensual and it's unlike anything that you see on the shelves, but it's like, where's that in like where can they like there's a place for them in the world of kind like in our comic industry oh yeah like it doesn't have to just be like a, a pay as you know monthly model on to get like a pdf or something um like there's so many books that i want there's like on my shelf but it's like how do we get that you know and i think you know if some does a good like example of like maybe now stores are going to like learn how to sell this to customers like who wants this kind of book you know there's mm -hmm. obviously people who do um but it's getting people like used to the idea i think it's yeah. like maybe they're yeah know, nervous <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's our society unfortunately. yeah it is it's society we do live in a society you know i mean i thought i've always found it really strange that you know you, you can get stuff like Walking Dead, which I love, on TV and in comic form where mm -hmm. it's okay to just show people getting their heads chopped off, but you can't swear or show, like, a boob. It, it's just that's just so weird to me. Yeah. I just don't get it. And when and, you look at, like, the book market, like, novels, you yeah. know, romance novels and, like, you know, smut, you know, book talk is huge and it's all, like, smut yeah. books. Yeah. Um, they they sell like crazy, but um, like in comics, when you open it up and you actually see the boob, you know, it's like, oh my god, what? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like there's, there's way crazier stuff going down in like like novels, you know, yeah. or in the world, <laughs> or on the news. Yeah. But like, you, it's, I think with comics, it's just the idea that you could just pick it up and open it up, and boom, there it is, and it's shocking, you know. It's, yeah, it's yeah. super yeah. interesting. But when you think about the lineage of just indie comics in general in the last 60 years, you know, take, you know, like take R. Crumb, for example, take the Her Los Bros Hernandez, for example, two of the most celebrated, you know, creators of all time. And they're all across the board. Their work is not safe. It is very much the opposite of it. And um, I think, what you know, I and I was speaking. I had an interview earlier this week with a, a couple of store owners, and we were talking about how, um, 
you know, Black Label kind of broke the the barrier for new comics these days, having this oddball layout, you know, magazine size. Distillery mm-hmm. comes in and, and, you know, all of the books have been hits. And then we were talking about um, Derek Kirk Kim's Last Mermaid breaking format down. And I think, you know, maybe this is the beginning of a shift in not just, you know, format size, but content in inside these books. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I took to some of the, well, I'm, I'm a fan of both of your works, but the idea of it, I didn't care who was, you know, it wouldn't, if you told me, you know, Mike Manley was doing it, I'd be like, all right, I'll check it out because it's an interesting story, you know? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I mean, like, I... I was I was growing up reading this stuff, you know, my teens, mm-hmm. like I'd get heavy metal and there'd be Sepieri and Minara and, you know, the lovely European hardcovers of Crepex and stuff. I, I loved mm-hmm. that stuff growing up and that's always kind of very edgy, but like in Europe it's it's more you know, it's it's okay to have these sure. books. It's seen as something that's like r- really bad, but you know, in terms of the Euro- European way of showing uh, sequential art, um, mm-hmm. they've all they've always used the large format books like Humanoid yeah. and all these publishers, and and I've always mm-hmm. I've always loved that. You know, some of my favorite stories are in that larger format print, like Jodorowsky's Bouncer and mm-hmm. all of those books. So. You know, the idea that there's a Western publisher, that um, a publisher in America that is um, going to put these stories out in that size, that was super exciting to me. Yeah. yeah. And you really do, like, as an artist, you think about it differently. Like, you can't yeah. just draw a book like Samna, you know, mm-hmm. like, I would, I didn't approach that at all, like my normal comics, like you have to change the way that you see, because the shape is different, you know? So yeah. you're using the page in a different way. It's like you, like, it's, this book was exciting on so many levels to do. And I think some of it was like going back to that, like, you know, I'm a student again and I'm relearning mm-hmm. how to do things and like experimenting. And, you know, you you wouldn't think it would be that much of a difference because it's just a little, it's bigger and then it, but it's wider too. And it just changes the way that you see the, the comic being told. Um, yeah, I don't know, more cinematic. I don't know. It's um it is, yeah. Yeah, there's something about it that I really like. Reading it, I get that. You know, I I I'm a big movie buff. I know both of you are. Uh and and reading it, I'm almost thinking to myself, like I can visualize this. Not that it I, you know, I look at it in the oh, I'd love to see this on the big screen. I can literally just read it and I'm visualizing, you know, the beats of of the way that the camera's gonna move and um it's one of one of the things that I really there's a space that's unfilled in the comic industry. Somebody needs to come in and start creating soundtracks for reading some of these great books. And uh it was one of the, just the things that I was wondering do either of you can either of you think of a composer or a score that would go well with reading Samba? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The first thing that that comes to mind is Popelvoa. I'm a big, a big fan of uh, German music from the okay. 80s, and Popelvoa is kind of very. Um, it, it's like I hate using this term. It's what it's called over here, but it's offensive kraut rock. Um, mm-hmm. It's like my favorite kind of music, and um, it's very much of that time but it's all acoustic and kind of cinematic it's amazing and there's also this incredible piece of music from Herzog's Nosferatu that Mm. was used in Hello Earth and I can't remember who it is but it's it's like a very very old um piece of classical music it's beautiful oh wow all right that's good I will have to Put that stuff on while I read the next issue. Uh, Becky, I anything was, that uh... <laughs> typo negative, like a hundred percent. Before we started this book, it was like you know I like to make Spotify playlists for everything that I do. <laughs> so yeah. It was just like just drop oh, that's all awesome. October rust on there. Like, whoop. <laughs> yeah, like for that's sure. really like, cool. It was, it was uh, you know Peter Steele, such an icon. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, rest in peace. 
for, for uh, sure. Definitely like an inspiration for this book. Yeah, so <laughs> many levels. <laughs> Well, you've always, you know, you've always worn your metal, your metal love on your, yeah. on your proverbial sleeves with yeah. not just the work that you've done, but like following you on social media, you know, and, uh, and we talked about it at Emerald City Comic Con. You did uh, posters, was it three years in a row for uh, uh, Northwest Terror Fest? Yeah, yeah, which is a great festival, like up in Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. I do it every year. So it's a... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's other things that I would put on this on the soundtrack too. But that's sure. like, <laughs> if I got to choose one, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, I mean, I, it's it's gonna sound pretty much uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cliche, but the score for the witch would be one of the things I would I would listen to while reading this. I mean, though, that score is kind of terrifying, though. There's a yeah. lot of chanting going on yeah, that sneaks sure. up on you. I, I for some reason I always go to like proto doom or like you know something like pentagram or like you know witchfinder general like mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'm always just going to this like you know 70s 80s just kind of like I don't know yeah but, but that's that's the beautiful thing about music we all yeah. find I mean in art in general we all find different things that we love from it and you know when I'm what I'm reading these days, it's a, a lot of Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross soundtracks. They oh, kind of, yeah, yeah, they, 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 Trent Reznor soundtracks, so they go with anything, like, yeah, they do, slap they it do. on whatever it is, like, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, pick you know your choice of Suspiria soundtracks, whether it's the yeah. original or it's the Tom York. Oh my I'm god, yeah, that goblin soundtrack for sure, like throw that on over yes. summer, and it's like it's gonna work, yeah. yeah. Um. One of the elements, and I and Becky, I heard you speak about this on on another interview, must have been last year. But one of the big elements of of the story is sleep paralysis, and and it's interesting because people have talked about it in the public more in like the last five six years. You know, the joke about my sleep paralysis demon. But then I had a friend explain to me what it what his experience was with it was, and then it made me think about how I had it when I was a kid mm. because I. I would wake up and I would, there would be people in my room and having a conversation like a party and I, I couldn't get out of bed to, to hang out with them. They weren't there. That wasn't real. And yeah. that's what sleep paralysis okay. is. It was, it was a happy sleep paralysis. That, that's unusual. <laughs> no, no, because I was terrified that I was like, I was in my underwear and all my friends were, you know, like that type of like that kind of thing where like I was trying to be a part of the party and I couldn't move and yeah you know um so um uh, is that something that both of you have ever experienced or is it just you becky it's like because it is a, a huge part of the story yeah that's how so that's how the story started was i had sleep paralysis and i don't have it anymore but it was there was a time in new york for like four or five years that i had it like sunny right it wasn't like all the time but it was like every once in a while you know i'd wake up and i'm in my room and there's just like a shadow in the door and i'm like freaking out i'm like my you know, in like the apartment I was in, like the guy below me had passed away. <laughs> he had died and like they didn't find him for weeks. <laughs> it was just that like, happened, that it happened was in my... I was like, it's the guy from oh. downstairs. He's haunting the apartment building. <laughs> but then I was like reading about it and it's like, oh yeah, this is just like your brain fucking up when you're trying to, when you wake up, you know, it's like still releasing chemicals so that you're yeah. move and you're asleep. And then your brain will because you're scared because you can't move like mm -hmm. and then your brain puts something there that you should be scared of so some yeah. people see like an old woman or they see aliens or they see like you're at a party and you there's people all around but you don't know what's going on but you're in your room and you're awake and you like are lucid enough to understand that but you know so it was it kind of started out of that like hey what was what would this have been like if it was because mm -hmm. i thought i was seeing a ghost or a demon or something and then it was like <laughs> very quickly like oh that's not what's actually happening but you know what if i lived in a time where that was like a very real yeah. thing you know seeing a demon would be like these are things that walk among us and we should be scared of um and and that's kind of where it was born and then it was like but what if it was sexy also because <laughs> <laughs> you kind of yeah. you just ask yourself that question even though it's not like it's the opposite of sexy in real life it's terrifying but you know, what if though what if, the, what if the demon was <laughs> yeah. i mean this is a sexy yeah. demon it's comics anything is possible so that's kind of what it started out of and i was explaining it to lisa and you, you've had like similar experiences 
Yeah. I mean, like in terms of sleep paralysis, I, I think I experienced it once, but because it's just once, maybe, maybe it was just a weird dream. But I mean, definitely when I was younger, I had a lot of waking nightmares where you're mm-hmm. kind of up and walking about, but you're still in the nightmare and people yeah. can see what you're doing and it's like crazy. Like I had nightmares all the time. So, um, yeah, it's, it's freaky stuff. It stays with you. And it's, I watched that. I remember when I was talking to uh, Becky, I watched that documentary. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's that documentary about sleep paralysis, Mm -hmm. uh, where, where it's talking about the phenomenon of everyone who's experiencing this, seeing a very similar thing and how, how weird that is. Um, and that, that's a pretty frightening documentary. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like, you know, when you think about, so, you know, things that affect the brain, like like schizophrenia, you know, that's yeah. a lot of people back in the day thought it was like God speaking to them. But mm-hmm. now that it's like changed to technology, it's like, oh, it's like the government's spying on me or, you know, it's like, the, so you can track, it, it's just like public consciousness, you know, and you don't think mm-hmm. it's like, it's like that shit, you know, it's, it's stuff that, um, you don't even think about is affecting you, but when you sleep, there it is, you know, because it's all around us. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny. Uh, the, the way it stays with you, like you said, uh, Tula, and, and I can still vividly remember this weird, I don't know if it was, it was waking dream where I thought I pushed the cat couch down the stairs when I was a kid, there was no couch upstairs to push downstairs. I, I, but I remember like waking my mom up and like, it is so interesting how, if we dive into the things that we're really unsure of about our own brains, um, what kind of great stories can come out of this? And some of this seems to have a lot of overlying, you know, different themes. You know, you've got the sleep paralysis, you've got the, you know, the, the religious beliefs versus like what's actually happening. Um, but then there's, there's a bit of the, the relationship aspect um, with Ingrid and uh, I'm forgetting her husband's name, Roland. Right? Yeah. Um, and how, she's you know she's trying to please him and he's a square i mean he's a square but he's a witch finder that's literally like he has to throw away any passion or you know any any fantasy that he might have because he's literally hunting women and uh so like that aspect of it is is real clear and you know that's a piece of the historicalness to it i assume yeah Yeah, definitely i mean that's like you know matthew hopkins shit he like wrote a whole book on it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's it's so stupid if you ever try to read it <laughs> i did for this book and i was like what is what is all this junk um but you know it's a real thing in roland's case in our story he's very much like a reluctant witch finder yeah like i think in so many stories you find that the guy who's like persecuting and like being the one who's like i'm finding the witches they're taking like a, an amount of glee and mm-hmm. you know pleasure from it and i wanted to show this he's not he's an interesting character because he's not he's kind of a bad guy a little bit but he's not really you know he's just trying to do the best that he can and and Mm -hmm. he's holding out he has to hold up the system that's like oppressive and shitty but yeah you know he's not without feeling so no 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 and 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 that first scene after he comes back and he basically says you know i'm glad that you weren't there because you shouldn't be seeing those things yeah yeah just showing that it's like it's not an easy thing for him to do he's not like yeah we burned the witch it's like (laughs) that was fucked up and <laughs> i'm glad you didn't see it like in the end of the day it's like i don't know we we, we in issue three which i don't know if it's going to come out by the time this is out uh, yeah it, it comes out the 27th correct yeah I, oh. this will be out sunday before the 27th cool well we we dive in a little bit more about like roland in the third book so oh good yeah good. yeah explore their relationship a little bit more as like what you know, as husband and wife, you know, they do love each other, but there's tension there. So, <clears throat> and so Tulip, are you happy closing the book in the third issue? Is there, you know, uh, obviously I haven't read it yet, but, uh, you know, where do we, where do we go from here? But are you, you know, is it wrapped up to your liking? Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not happy closing the book on the third issue because I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't I don't want to stop <laughs> but um, we um, you know that's what we signed up for and I think Becky and I could have done a lot more but we're very very happy with how the story was told and how it ends it just seems very perfect but because we love it so much we will revisit it 
we are we're going to do more. Yeah, That's, we've already uh, we've already figured out the sequel. No. So. <laughs> We, it ended and we were both like, why? <laughs> why does this have to end? <laughs> what am I doing with my life? It was just like, we've been, this is a book that we've been working on, working on like for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like always been unfinished. And now that it's done, it's like, fuck. What? You know, we yeah, hope that things lined up, but it's, <laughs> it's like, it's not. Is that, the, is that the ongoing? Of uh, to to your knowledges, uh, is this the ongoing model for distillery going forward? Like three issue stints, and then you know that's the story. Or are there plans for bigger ones? I I don't. So I think that it it was it was three issues, but I wouldn't put it past Chip and David to mix it up a little bit. I think mm -hmm. uh, they're they're founders that are very very open to hearing the ideas of of what the creators want to do. So if someone comes along wanting to do a, a larger story, I'm pretty sure that we will see that. Yeah, I mean, first to start, it's a great model because you get in, you get the full story. It's basically six issues because yeah, I think each yeah. story of ours was like in the fifty page counts. So it's like a little over two issues uh, mm -hmm. for each book, and then it's done. And it's like you know, as a new publisher, stores don't have to like, you know, oh, we're going to commit to this hundred issue series or whatever, or this mm -hmm. ongoing. We don't know when it's going to end. It's like if people can get in, tell a really good story, and then like like Samna, where it's like the book is closed and it's finished, but there's still so much to tell with the idea of it you know so it's like to go in and do a sequel it might not be like a direct you know and we've already talked to them about it a little bit and everyone's like yeah let's do a sequel <laughs> <laughs> very like I, what i love about distillery is like it's a very like hell yes kind of yeah. you know like no yeah. one's ever been like oh that's not we don't know about this <laughs> yeah we're like let's talk about it later it's like hell yes let's do it let's put it on the schedule when are we gonna get when are, when is this gonna happen very supportive yeah it's brought in a lot of new readers. I mean, I, I you know, I, I'm biased because I know, you know, I pick up books based on who's involved. But from what I can see, there's a lot of people that aren't familiar with either of you or one of you that are falling in love with this book. And, I, you know, that's kind of that's that's the hope. Right. You want to drag in as many new people. Um, you know, I say and I said to you at, at Emerald City Comic Con or both of you. You know, this is for the A24 lovers, you know, people that are into those movies, Midsummer, The Witch, you know, uh, the, anything Eggers and Ari Aster have done. Like, if you like that, you're going to enjoy this. Um, yeah. Have Have they come knocking on your door yet? <laughs> to, to... <laughs> that would be well, amazing. We can't really talk about that side of things, but we mm -hmm. have had emails. I'm not going to say who they're from. But... Sure. We have had those kind of emails. Yeah, that's awesome. it's which is that's exciting, but it's also like I love I love that Distillery is like a comics first publisher. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not in it to make a movie. We did Sona because yeah. it's like we want to tell this story. So um, it's <laughs> as exciting as it is. It's always like in the back of my head. It's like, but the comics always going to be like the number one like thing. It's like how this yeah. story is supposed to be told. You know? Yeah. It'd be no, interesting I... to see it done as a film. Like, I'd be curious, like, how could you, like, are you switch directors through the yeah. <laughs> two different directors, maybe? I mean, look, it, and and not to drag this into a movie conversation completely, but it worked for Sin City. I mean, Miller and, and Rodriguez, they put their best foot forwards and, and forward, and they created probably the best, you know, page to screen I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know that's not the end goal, but I, you know, as a fan of A24, I mean, The Witch, come on. It's such a good movie. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it, the Witch was it, absolutely incredible. Yeah. It changed. It kind of changed a lot of things in the way that I, I want to go see movies. And I, you know, <clears throat> um, one of the things that you're both really known for is your screen print work, your posters, your movie artwork, um, you know, I, and, and I'd be remiss to not talk about that because uh, with that, and I don't know if you're both video game gamers, but you both you both did screen prints for two of the greatest video games ever. And fortunately, Tula, yours sold out so quick I don't have it. But Becky, you did this Castlevania yeah. one a long time ago, and yeah. and Tula, you 
you did all that artwork for Last of Us. And, I did, yeah. And, and I'll put that up on the screen, some of that stuff. But those are two... I mean, I think Last of Us is the greatest video game of all time, especially the second one. And Castlevania is my childhood. Like, that's, you know... So <clears throat> is that... Um, it's just... I know you're a gamer, but have you both played those respective games at all? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I um, I I can't remember how old I was. Maybe like eight, eighteen, early twenties. I became obsessed with Resident Evil and all the survival <laughs> horror uh, to the point where I was calling into work sick so I could just spend my days playing. <laughs> playing <laughs> That's... But I became a bit too obsessed, and yeah. then um, and now that I've got a kid and I work all the time, I have mm -hmm. absolutely no time for that stuff at all. However, I did play The Last of Us, and I didn't have the time to play it all, but I played a lot of it, and I loved so it. I am just yeah. a massive like survival horror fan, and um, any of any of those stories that are based around kind of a, a creepy universe that kind of opens itself up to you where you discover things. I love that kind of stuff. Post-apocalyptic stuff is it's my bag. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. video games is such a great place for like horror too, because it puts you right there. Like yeah. I remember I remember going through like Silent Hill with friends and being like, no, you you do this part. Like you know, start, like pushing the controller back and forth. It's amazing. I it love so and it's the you know another form of storytelling that's just you know really raised its bar consistently since you know I was a kid and you know I, I think we're all in the same age gap like since we were all kids like if you look at where the storytelling is gone and and I love that um you know we'll wrap it up and maybe we can do another one maybe after the third issue comes out yeah. um, because yeah. I you know, I, I this channel's all about the love of comics, and you know, I just I just want to keep talking about comics and stuff, and video games and music and all that. Yeah, um, this all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. All right. Well, before before we get going, um, do we are we allowed to talk about anything that might be coming out in the future? There's a certain poster that Becky told me about that she's doing, but I don't know if she can talk about oh, yeah, that. I can't talk about that one yet, but that's fine. okay. Uh, but I'm doing, I'm working on a short thing with Garth Ennis for Boom coming up. So oh, that's oh, yeah. fun. Yeah, we did a creep show short um, last year when it was so fun to work with him. Uh, and so we had such a good time. We're doing it again. Not yeah, creep that, show, but we're just working together. <laughs> that creep show story, if, uh, if, if my loyal friends have not checked that out, uh, once again, if you are of a certain political mind or too religious, <laughs> stay the <laughs> fuck away from that comic. But if you are open and willing to hear somebody else's point of view and a great point of view, then check out that creep show story. Yeah. Um, it and, read like a long lost preacher script and it's so fucked yeah. up and darkly. I mean, it's a great creep show story anyway. It has that mm -hmm. shit. It's like such, it's funny in like the worst possible way. <laughs> yes. I agree with that. And then, uh, um, Dula, anything coming up, uh, on your pipeline? Yeah, um, so I when I finished Somner, I went straight back into um, another comic I'm working on, which I started right before Somner. I paused it to get mm. Somner in. Um, it's not announced yet, so I can't talk about it too much, but it's with a writer that I love, um, and it is uh, uh, an erotic horror <laughs> yeah. um, just, um, during the satanic panic. That's awesome. That I I've seen it the pages and they're so good. So keep your eyes peeled for Yeah. And and fun. um yep. Um, Barnstormers was one of your more recent efforts too, which was fantastic. So if, yeah. if nobody's checked that out, check that out. And then Thought Bubble, which is yeah. you know, your your brainchild, uh, that's in November, correct? Yeah, I, I actually don't don't know when the date is. It's usually mid-November, so I would imagine it's the weekend around the 14th. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, I set that up, I think, 16 years ago now. Is it 16 years? Which is insane. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I finally managed to step away. Um, when was it? Like, I've gradually been stepping away, like, five years ago. Um, mm -hmm were taking over and then uh it's a couple of years ago now that i stepped away completely and the guys are running it there um martha amy and chloe are running it better than i ever could um 
the show is amazing and I get to enjoy it more now because I can just turn up and have fun without all the stress and worry. Um, mm -hmm. so it's my favorite show. I love it. And I mean, of course I would say that, but <laughs> I love the guys there so much and it's got, it's got such a kind of friendly party vibe to it that mm -hmm. it's just so, it's so, such a nice show. Yeah, it's one of my favorite cons. So I think I'm going to come this year, but not table. I'm just going to hang out with you. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's one I've always wanted to go to. And my birthday's in November. So maybe I'll treat myself this year. Oh, I don't, if I don't go to Japan in November, I'll go to, I'll go to Thought Bubble. You get a uh, yeah, yeah. I, I really would be excited to go. All right. So, uh, for anybody watching, you can find all of the links to both of their social medias down there. Uh, Distillery is the publisher and Soma issue three comes out the week that you're seeing this. And then if you're seeing this after the fact, well, time machine, go back and get it. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to thank both of you, Tula and Becky, for doing this. I had a great time and I hope we can do this again. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Wasn't that a lot of fun? I hope you really enjoyed that interview. I'm going to have both Becky and Tula back on after the third issue comes out so we can talk full on spoilers. If you have not read this, ask your store if they can still order copies of issues one and two and pick up issue three coming out March 27th in just a few days or in the past. See you next week on the Hershow Vitae. Bye. Sexy time. <laughs>